Hey, hey, you all. Welcome, welcome, welcome back. Y'all already know what it is. You see the title of this video. This is Real Housewives of Potomac, R-H-O-P, season six, episode one. I'm happy to go ahead and get into it. So, when the producers opened up the show and they asked the cast, if you could describe last season in one word, what would it be? The word I chose, and I know I ain't on the cast, but, but I chose my word, it would be brutal. <laughs> Last year was a lot to watch. It was a lot to discuss. It was a lot to interact on social media. Like, Monique's fans swarmed people's comments and left pages on pages on pages worth of opinions. So, I'm kind of glad to have that dark cloud removed, whether it was voluntary or involuntary. I won't speculate. <laughs> But I'm happy to see a new character introduced. Um, I think there's um, a new friend of the show that will be introduced shortly. So I'm happy for all that. So let's just go ahead and jump right in. So Wendy is filming her silhouette challenge for her nude interlude invitation. I'm here for it, right? I love the theme. Um, I love the silhouette. The only minor critique I would have is Wendy. <laughs> You were stiff. <laughs> she was bending over and it looked like she was having trouble. She was stretching and doing calisthenics. But I think the reason why she was having such trouble moving is because A, she just had surgery. And two, she has some sort of a waist trainer on. And uh, also, uh, Wendy, <laughs> come close, girl. They tell me that um, for the new booty, you have to wait at least one year to twerk because otherwise it won't move. It'll be stiff. Just ask Nicki Minaj. <laughs> Barbs don't eat me up. <laughs> Next, we get to Ashley and the Predator. Listen, if you are new to my channel, I am not a fan of Michael. I have a problem with someone who has been allowed um, without consequence to run around grabbing people's behinds without their permission. <laughs> and, you know, he's just here on our screen. And I can guarantee you if Michael was running around grabbing white women's behinds without their permission, he'd be under a jail cell. But since it was men, no one gives a damn. I'm not here for them trying to reset Michael's image. I don't care if he's father of the year. I don't care if he's grandfather of the year. I don't care if he's husbands of the year. He still grabs people's behinds without permission. So that whole spiel about Ashley and him having had sex in four months, baby, it could be four more months and I wouldn't give a damn. It could be four years and I wouldn't care. And let me tell it, Michael having sex with everybody else except for Ashley, moving on from this nonsense. Next, we see that Giselle is going to visit Candace in her new <laughs> $1.1 million home, 10,000 plus square feet, six bedrooms, seven bathrooms, listen. I'm happy for it. If, if Candace can afford a $1.1 million home, I say kudos to you. I am here for the opulence. I am here for the wealth. Um, they flashed to where her townhouse that I think her mom owned sold for $800,000. Listen, I don't care if Dorothy got all the money. I don't care if they split it. Hell, I don't care if Dorothy gave it to her for a housewarming gift. How many of y'all's mamas? got damn near $1 million just to splurge on you. <laughs> damn sure not Ashley. So anyways, <laughs> I'm not I'm not going to go out to Ashley no more this episode, y'all, I promise. But anyways, um, Giselle comes in, and did y'all notice, one, she was driving a Range Rover, which was different because if my memory serves me correctly, last season, <laughs> Giselle was driving that clown car, a.k.a. Countryman. No shame if you drive one, but... Every time I see a countryman, it looks like one of those clown cars that Krusty the Clown was in on The Simpsons. So, no shade, I'm just saying. Also, two, um, or B, I don't know if I start off on letters or numbers. My bad. <laughs> but also, Giselle came into Candace's house looking like a tin man. So, I see that she did not take my advice and call up Real Housewives of Atlanta and for their stylist. I'm not going to have it this time, y'all. I'm not. You on a show with Portia Giselle, you better be better than that. I'm so sick of you and that foolish dressing you do. Just a beautiful woman with no fashion sense. It's like having chicken that's unseasoned. Oh, just disgusting. But anyways, Giselle and Candace vision. She takes her over her house. She gives her a tour. Apparently Candace's mom has a room with a cardboard cutout. No, ma'am. Creepy creepy 
They go back down to the living room and just discuss what's going on. Candace is in her second semester for her master's at the Howard University. Shout out to you. And then Giselle says that her and Jamal's relationship is strained. Listen, I'm not going to play around with Giselle this season, y'all. I'm going to wrap this one up and tie it with a bow. When Jamal said last season that he was not going to return to the show, what he effectively did is he said, cut, scene over. <laughs> and he went on back down to Atlanta. Honey, he ain't think about Giselle. Do I think him and Giselle are good friends? Sure. They seem to interact well. Were they ever in a relationship or lovers? No. So we could just move on past this concocted storyline that Giselle didn't have for two, to two seasons or whatever it was. I'm over it. They then begin to talk about Karen. And so Candace basically is saying how she really did love Karen. But, you know, Karen played her. Not only did she take Monique's side and made it seem like Candace did something more than what actually happened, right? Than what we all saw. But she then called HR on her, which Karen used to be my favorite on Potomac. Right now, I don't have a favorite because of that. But I'm willing for Karen to earn it back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing that spot is open so so anyone can slip in and take it but um listen Candace has a right to not want to you know to not really want to associate with Karen she said that she doesn't want to be angry it's understandable because if you would have called HR on me for me telling you to go to hell and then say I threatened your life baby I would never talk to you again You would see me, I'd say, oh, hello, Karen. I would be cordial. And that would be the extent of our conversation. Because dare you say, I threatened you again. That was some, I didn't like that, Karen. Like, Karen literally pulled a Karen. So then, <laughs> Giselle is like, listen, it's a big F you for Karen, right? She embarrassed me and my family, which no, she embarrassed you. She didn't say anything about your children. She talked about Jamal. Uh, she didn't tell a lot about Jamal, right? Well, it wasn't a lot. You didn't like it, but it wasn't a lot. Um, so she didn't tell a lot on you and your family because if it was the truth, Jamal would be back here this season filming with you, pretending like he was your boyfriend, right? Okay then, right? So we, we just gonna move on from that. But she's upset and she says what she's going to do is she's going to tell Karen's truth. So listen. And maybe I'll save it for the dinner table. No, I'll say it right here. Uh, Giselle, you have all this smoke for Karen. You should have had it at the reunion. Instead, you stayed silent. You know why? Because in Giselle's one-on-ones and her confessionals, she has all smoke. All smoke. Because someone has written it for her. But when she gets to the reunion, she freestyles it and she fails. So all this smoke that you have for Karen now, you should have had it when her and Monique was coming for your raggedy neck. Moving on. Next, we get to Karen and Ray, and they are discussing their 25th wedding anniversary. It's a blessing <laughs> to make it to 25 years, so I am not mad. But Ray wants something small and intimate, which good luck, Ray, because you ain't getting that because Karen is on a reality TV show, and she wants something large, ostentatious, over the top, <laughs> and that's what she's going to get. So they're calling their renewal so nice. They had to do it twice, which I like that. I mean, either way you slice it, it's a renewal. Karen then talks about the guest list and she's saying how she would only invite people who are there for her and Ray, like who love both her and Ray. And that does not include Giselle because as Giselle says, she can't stand. She can't stand Karen. And I thought it was funny how Ray was like, oh, well, there's some hope there. And uh, Karen was like, uh, hell no. Uh-uh. Now, if you talk about my husband, okay, she says she's misdirecting her anger um, on her when it should be on Jamal, which I agree. You mad at somebody, but it shouldn't be Karen. But anyways, Wendy then sends her nude interlude invitation, and everybody's reaction was hilarious. Hands down, the top two were Ashley's and um, Ray's. When Ray, when Ray saw that silhouette, he was like, wait a minute, let, let me get my glasses. <laughs> But let me get like he could not pick up his glasses fast enough even at the end he was like you know I, I just want to know when is the party because I need to look at my calendar so that I can go to the new party and Karen was like honey if you don't go get your robe <laughs> and your thick socks and your house shoes and your warm milk no way you are not going to nobody's new party and then on top of that I thought it was so cute 
how when Ashley received it, she said, Dean, close your eyes. And he said, I thought that was so cute that he literally closed his eyes. So I'm ready to get to this new interlude part because we got a lot of drama going on there. Moving on. Next, we see Robin and Juan. Listen, I'm not going to play with Robin and Juan. I don't see a spark of love there. I don't see... I just don't see the love in their relationship. It seems like they're more like good friends and companions and buddies, whether than they are, you know, married or engaged, whatever they are today and tomorrow. So the producer asked Robin, Robin, <laughs> it's the sixth season. And we're going to ask this question for the millionth time. When are you and Juan getting married? Drum roll. <laughs> Never. <laughs> That's the short and skinny of it, everyone. She says that because of the pandemic and everything going on, things got moved back and that right now it's not on the top of their list, yet they're building a home together. Make, make it make sense. So when they sit down, Juan starts to talk about how he's concerned about the health of his family. He, want his, he wants his family to be more healthy. Apparently, Robin sleeps in till 10 a.m. and then she orders the kids Chick-fil-A for breakfast. So I'm guessing, I'm assuming the way Juan described it, that he leaves early in the morning. Because here's the thing. If you're there, then you can get up and cook for them, Juan. So I'm just going to assume that you have already left the house and that the kids are like, wait a minute. Listen, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. All right, mom, we hungry. Get up and order something. If you are in the house, actually, even before you leave, if you're so worried about your children's healthy journey, you can get up in the morning and cook and give them a full breakfast, right? Because the way Robin was talking in her confessional, she was saying that she's in a slump and how she feels overwhelmed. She says that she feels like there's nothing to do, like there's nothing to look forward to. You know, you, you can't go anywhere, you can't go, you can't do anything. And she's not the only one that is suffering from being in a slump in the pandemic. Listen, We've never been in a pandemic. This, this is once in a lifetime. And the fact that we are experiencing this, no one knows how to navigate this. And I just felt Juan should have been a tad bit more gentle with her than to say, listen, that's unattractive. Like, what type of BS is that? That everything for Juan is based on whether it's attractive or not. How about your fiance's in a slump? How about you recognize that and you be gentle towards her? How about you start conversations with her? How about you all look to maybe visiting a therapist and helping her get out of that slump? There are plenty of people that are suffering during the pandemic. Robin's not the only one. And for you to be so selfish that you just write it off as unattractive and then follow it up with, I want a baby girl. And then you say, well, you're 41. Well, how old are you, Juan? Aren't you balding in the top of your head? You want to talk about unattractive? It was unattractive when you were broke. It was unattractive when you weren't in the NBA anymore. It was unattractive when you was laying low and spreading it wide. That's unattractive. Your wife is going through some real emotions, right? So if you see that she's not doing her part, it's your duty as a spouse or a partner to help them move through that slump or I don't want to say depression because I don't think that's what Robin called it but through that depression instead you're focusing on having a child more specifically a girl Robin don't do it before you know it you'll be pregnant and in labor and you still will not be married to Juan Ditchin it's a trap don't do it moving on next we get to Candace and Chris and we see Candace with her bonus children not much to talk about here. The only thing I want to mention is the producers asking them when they were going to have children. I am so against people questioning couples and more specifically women about when they're going to get pregnant. One, you don't know what's going on. One, you don't know if they or she even wants children. Two, you don't know if maybe there's an issue with fertility or not. So why keep asking that question? Chris has enough kids for everybody. He has three kids. And as Candace said, as her mom pointed out, you'll be his third baby mama. That ain't no good look. I mean, listen, <laughs> when Candace said that Chris was doing online cooking tutorials or whatever he was doing, honey, Chris is a baby daddy and a stay-at-home father. You have three bonus children. 
Let's just stop there, moving on. Next, we get to Wendy's nude interlude reveal party. And we have a lot to discuss, so we just gonna go ahead and dig right on in. So I thought it was funny when she and Eddie called their boys down to get a, a nipple cupcake. And when they got it, they said, so what is this? And they're looking and they're like, I don't know a cupcake like mama. Don't you got 20 degrees? Don't you know this is a cupcake? Dr. Wendy? Like, don't, don't be asking me those stupid questions, mama, right? So then her and Eddie was like, no, what is this? And they literally looked at each other like, is this the test? <laughs> like, I just told her it was a cupcake. What does she mean? What is it? So when they unwrapped it and bid, they said, it's chocolate. <laughs> I, I love that because th just the innocence of a child is something about that that makes me happy because I know some children that are younger than her boys that can recite every lyric to Meg the Stallion. How you know her lyrics better than me? And you, you a baby. So I really do appreciate that they're still in that innocent stage. They're not jaded yet. So I just found that scene really cute. Next, um, we see the women begin to arrive one by one. Giselle arrives first. I don't know what that brown burlap sack was, but a damn sure one nude, right? Everyone has a different shade of nude, right? If you ask me what nude was, I would not wear brown. I would wear like a light tan or something like that. I wouldn't wear brown, but... Once again, listen, listen, Giselle, I'm tired of your foolishness now. You on a show with Portia. All you have to do is tap her on her shoulder and say, listen, sis, do me a favor. Can you hook me up with your stylist number or contact information? Like at this point, I'm gonna stop extending you grace and mercy, Giselle, because I'm tired of you coming on my TV every Sunday looking like a fool. I'm so sick of it. Then we see Robin arrive, which y'all already know. Wherever Giselle go, Robin ain't too far behind. She's like a little dog, just an old loyal dog wagging her tail behind uh, Giselle. So when she arrives, of course, nosy ass Giselle takes her over to the table, to the dinner table. And she's walking her around, you know, okay, it's me, it's Ashley. Who's Mia? First of all, one, whose childish ass handwriting was that on those place cards? <laughs> whose childish ass handwriting was that? Because Wendy, you a doctor, you got 20 degrees, Eddie's a lawyer. You telling me you could have gone and got those printed out. Like, which one of your children wrote everyone's name on those name cards? I'm, I'm just trying to figure out because it was in black ink and that wasn't no good look. But anyways, so when she points it out to Robin, Giselle goes, I don't know that bitch. Do you know that bitch? First of all, very vulgar. I said that last season. Giselle is very vulgar. I couldn't imagine how she used to speak as a first lady. Can you? I know she probably used to gossip something terrible about the women in the church. I just was like, why she gotta be a B word? Why she gotta be a female dog? You haven't even met her yet, Giselle. Like literally her claws come out as soon as a new woman comes into the group. Like she, she's so jealous. To say she's so beautiful, she has such a mean spirit and ugly heart. But anyways, so then we see Karen and Mia riding together. So my initial thoughts about Mia when I saw her in this scene is that she's had too much Botox. And that's even before we arrived at the dinner scene and she went through all her procedures that she's had. Way too much Botox. Beautiful woman, but I'm going to tell you the same advice that I told Aubrey all day. You don't need any more Botox. You don't need any more injections. This will be a good place to stop. Anything else and your lips going to be spread from one ear to the other. Stop while you're ahead, Mia. So, they go into Mia. She owns several franchises. I think one of them is a joint chiropractic. Initially, I thought she was a doctor, but it just sounds like she's a business owner, which is still good. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with a boss. I'm here for you on owning multiple businesses. While they are there, Karen is filling her in on the girl. She talks a little about, a bit about Candace and how she hopes to see her and reconcile. She also acknowledges that Candace is deeply hurt, which yeah, she is because of the foolishness you pulled, Karen. If you would have called HR on me, I would never speak to you again. She then also takes the time to fill Mia in on Giselle. You know, Giselle gets jealous when pretty women and young women come around. Now, listen, I don't know about the young part with Mia, which we'll get to in a second, but 
I'm fine with Giselle warning her because if you're my friend, I am going to warn you so you won't be caught off guard in the lion's den. Absolutely. So I was with Karen on that. Next, Ashley, y'all. I'm trying not to go in because she is pregnant. Why was she wearing a white spring dress from Forever 21 with gray boots and a black purse? I just, at this point, Potomac, y'all do it to yourselves. Literally, Atlanta is a call away. Did you see how Kenya, Cynthia, and Portia showed up to their last reunion? Then God damn it, get in formation. I'm tired of this foolishness coming on my screen looking like a fool. But anyways, Ashley is pregnant. So I'm just going to write it off because she's pregnant. She probably was like, listen, I, I don't know if I have a new nothing. I'm just going to grab the first thing I see and put it on. But but let's listen, after you give birth, I'm going to need y'all to call Atlanta. I'm not going to keep saying that in every review now. We're not going to do that. So Candace isn't coming because she had diarrhea. Robin thinks she's trying to avoid Karen. You all let me know what you thought about that. I don't think that Candace was trying to avoid Karen. I do think she had diarrhea. I think she had the bubble guts. I think she had to drop the brown kids off at the pool. Okay? <laughs> like, I think that she had an upset stomach. That can happen. And also, here's an idea. She could have had an upset stomach because she was nervous too. Remember, she did get attacked last season. I know some of y'all don't care about that, but she did get attacked. I'm not saying she has PTSD, but she did get attacked last season. And so she might have felt overwhelmed. Sometimes when people get anxious and nervous, they get the bubble guts. I can see it, but I'm not here for Robin trying to create this narrative that she's scared of Karen. Like, girl, Robin, worry about Juan. <laughs> you got enough to focus on in the Dixon household. And next we see Karen and Mia arrive. Let me tell you something. You could have sold Giselle for a penny. <laughs> when Karen and Mia came in, Giselle's head whipped around and just stayed on pause. And she was looking, I'm guessing she was expecting some sort of apology, but honey, you're never gonna get it. <laughs> you're never going to get it. And the way I look at it is, Karen and Giselle, they both have said things about each other. So I don't know what type of grand apology Giselle is waiting for, but baby, you, you gonna be waiting. So next, of course, we have to grill the new girl because I mean, they have to introduce her to the audience, right? She just can't show up and start talking. So Mia has three kids, two boys, one girl. Um, she lives in the harbor, darling. She's a businesswoman. She owns multiple businesses. She's a serial entrepreneur. And she doesn't have just one home. She has two homes. And baby, when I tell you Giselle almost broke her neck, she was feeling her ponytail. When she heard two, she... Yeah, yeah, Janelle. Janelle, Janelle, get that crook right in your neck. Because yes, she has two homes. Remind you of somebody familiar? <laughs> I'm telling you, Giselle is green with envy she didn't say anything to mia but she wanted to but she knew not to repeat what she did with monique in the past seasons right so mia also has four step grandchildren her husband is significantly older than her so now here's where things got a little murky mia says that her husband is 68 and at first she was 38 years younger than him. Then the girls start doing the math. They start carrying one and dividing and all this. And please excuse my dear on silent. They said, no ma'am, there's no way that he's 68 and you 30. No boo, the, the Botox says differently. Then she said, oh no, <laughs> he's 32 years younger than me. Then she said, I'm 36 years old. Mia! <laughs> I don't want us to start off our relationship on live. Mia, if you're 36, I'm 19. You're not 36. 46? Yes. 36? No. You're a beautiful woman. Right now, we don't need no more feelings. We're done. You're a beautiful woman, but you're not 36. And if you are, you are a hard 36. And that would be due to all of the Botox and fillers. After a certain point, it becomes too much. And here's what I think. The reason why Mia couldn't tell them the amount of years they were apart, I think Mia has been lying about her age. 
And shit, I'll take a step further. I think she lied about her age to her husband as well. Oh, I'm, not, I'm 36. Where's the social security card? Where's the birth certificate? I, I have no reason to believe because Ashley should be 34. You are telling me that you're two years older than Ashley and you look 10 years older than her. I just, I don't believe it. And no way in hell that me is 36, moving on. So next we get to Wendy and she's going to explain her nude interlude invitation. And when Giselle said, Wendy, land the plane, I rarely agree with anything Giselle says, but her and I were here on this. She gets into this long story about, I chose this because I needed to get back to me. She said that at least 20 times. And then she sat there and said, the definition of interlude. I said, oh no, I said, Ebony K. Williams, I know you when I see you, get your ass back to New York. No, we won't. We will not be giving the girls a history lesson, a learning lesson. We won't be doing any of that today. If you just don't go here and reveal your new breast and get it over with and Thankfully, she finally did. She said, meet Happy and Ness, and all the women were excited. I have to say, Wendy's boob job looks great. She didn't get them too big. Whoever did it, they look nice on her. It's sexy, but it's not too much, right? So when she was at the table and she said, you know, I could wear a t-shirt, I could wear a blouse, but when I wanna pop out, I pop out. And she's right. So far, her boobs look great. But uh, Wendy, the girls asked what else you had done. You said, oh, I had my boob jobs and other tweaks. Why is it that when women get cosmetic surgery that they just cannot own up and say, listen, I had my nose done, I had my boobs done, I had a tummy done, I had a booty done. Like, why can't y'all just be honest? If you spent all that money for, should you be proud? Hell, we know it ain't natural, Wendy. And then Bravo, listen, I killed over and rolled around in the floor when Bravo did the flashback and they put the two pictures side to side, baby, that Gucci belt and that yellow outfit did nothing. <laughs> I mean, literally, the belt was down over her behind. I said, ooh, I said, Bravo, y'all so shady for that. We, we know Wendy wasn't shaped like much, but damn, y'all didn't have to do it like that. So anyways, they get to the dinner table and here's where Wendy kind of turned me off a bit. I don't know why she was being so defensive about the work she had done. It's obvious you had a boob job. It's obvious you had a tummy tuck. And it's more than obvious that you had your booty done, right? So when Mia sat down, I felt like Mia was like, oh my God, you look so good. Like, I just can't stop looking at it. And she said, so what other, what other work did you have? I didn't take it as shame. You all tell me. I took it as her being excited and that she was going to share and like, girl, let me tell you something. Look out for this with your boob job because I had my boobs done like two to four times. I didn't feel like she was doing to be shady. And Wendy, she just steps back with, um, I've had my boobs done and other tweaks, but what have you had done? You look like you've had a lot of work. See, let me tell you something, Wendy. If Mia would have cussed you out in your own house, she would have been well within her right because you were trying to sneak diss her with that last part of your sentence of, cause you look like you've had a lot done, um, but so do you. So do you, Wendy. All, all that ain't yours. All this ain't yours. You've had a lot done. Believe it or not, having your BBL, having a tummy tuck, and having a breast augmentation, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of times for someone to cut you open, to put, things in your body and shape your body in ways that it was not naturally born with. So I, I really don't want to hear that. But you know what? I think I'm going to like Mia because she didn't yell. She didn't scream. She didn't curse. She's like, listen, let's talk about it. I've had 20 boob jobs. I get Botox every two weeks. I've had filler. Shoot, I even had my clit done. Like, since you're trying to call me out, let's talk about it from head to toe. So I was here for Mia with that. If you're going to call me out, I'm going to run down the entire list. Um, I also didn't like how Wendy said, well, I haven't had any of those things done. Cosmetic surgery is cosmetic surgery. It doesn't matter if you've had fillers or not. It doesn't matter if you had vaginal rejuvenation or not. The fact is, you've had your body done and it's not in its natural state. So let's not act like Mia is beneath you because she's had all this work done because most people, when they get 
plastic surgery, they keep going. They keep going until they look a mess. Look at Aubrey O'Day. So we get to the last scene and I think that Wendy and Giselle got together and had an understanding about how the dinner was going to go down. And as we go through it, I'll point out why. It just seemed too concocted. You know, um, Giselle and Wendy kept glancing at each other. It, it, it almost seemed like they had talked about this and what Giselle was gonna do. Like literally, Wendy, you're gonna say this and you're gonna throw it to me like this. I, I didn't like that because Wendy, Giselle is not your friend and you're gonna find that out. But anyways, Wendy brings up Candace and she tells Karen, listen, Candace wasn't able to come because she has an upset stomach. Robin, once again, says that she feels like Candace just didn't want to see Karen or interact with her, which if she didn't, so what? I don't have to. This woman called HR on me. She tried to get me in trouble. I would never speak to Karen if I were Candace. I would say hi and bye, that's it. Dare you accuse me of threatening you if I do anything else. So then Ashley, chimes in and says, I don't know if me and Candace will ever get in a good place. No, you won't, Ashley. You know why? Because as soon as the fight happened last season, you ran out the bathroom, you didn't even see it, you automatically took Monique's side, and then you gave a statement about an incident that was separate and had nothing to do with what happened between her and Monique. Because what you did say is that you were in that woman's house. I don't care if it was her mama's house because Ashley's mama don't even have a house. Do not get me started. You were in her house. She asked you to leave multiple times and you were in her face and you refused. Based on your logic, Candace should have started wailing upside your head, but she didn't. She pulled a butter knife, which is better than what I would have done. When I asked you to leave, that's what I mean. I'm not gonna give you any grace and mercy because after I decline your invite, you're now on my property without permission. No ma'am, so anyways, no, you're not in a good place, so shut up, Ashley. But then Wendy says, well, my hope is we can collectively get to a great place together. In comes Giselle. Giselle says, well, that might be difficult for some of us, Wendy. And then Wendy goes, why? And she looks at Karen and Giselle, set up. Set up. I'm not saying they smoke. You know what? It's possible they could have set up Karen because that just played too well. So then Giselle and Karen get into it. Giselle says, well, we all know that I can't stand Karen. And without missing a beat, Karen said, <coughs> the feeling's mutual. Like, girl, I don't care if you don't like me. Well, what, what is, what's that supposed to do? Ooh, I'm supposed to be scared? Girl, what you gonna do? You gonna kick me one of those stovepipe legs? No, God. So then Giselle says that what she's going to do is she's going to tell all of Karen's truths, her drunk truths, her cheating truths, her broke truths. Honey, these truths are tired and delayed. Giselle, we've already heard this before. We've heard about Karen being an alcoholic. Hell, that's been the rule about everybody on the show. We've heard about her being broke. Ray didn't pay his taxes. Honey, this is tired and stale. Do you have anything different? If not, we don't want to hear. No need to slowly release it during the season. Let's just hurry up and wrap it up. So then Karen says that Giselle should be talking about nobody because she had a fiery box, baby. She had a hot box. Giselle gonna say she got a whap box. <laughs> I wanna know what Jamal thinks about that. <laughs> And so Giselle says at least her ding dong isn't broken. And Karen says, well, your ding dong is in everyone's vagina. And baby, Giselle thought she was doing something. At least it works. At least it works. Giselle. <laughs> I don't think that comeback landed how you thought it would. At least it works. Okay, <laughs> that's the standard, right? That's the standard, at least it works. <laughs> not with you, Giselle, not with you. So then Karen, I mean, she literally ended the episode perfectly. She said, and I'm reading, I didn't say this, Karen said this. She said, you're a broken whore from Hampton University and everybody knows it. I said, ooh, ooh, Karen. I said, now what did Hampton University have to do with this? Now, why are they always throwing it? <laughs> In the words of Nene, see, I'm always throwing in things. So 
She then says, and that's why we want, we went to Sing Sing. I have no clue what Karen is talking about. I'm guessing they're going to clear it up next episode, but this episode was like, it was good. So far, I'm liking Mia. Y'all get down in the comments. Y'all let me know your thoughts. And if there's nothing else, thank you for watching. And I will see you all later. Mwah. Bye. <laughs> You're a slut from the 90s. <laughs>